Hello, beautiful people. I am Oliver Perrin, joined this evening, well, perhaps it's evening where you are, I think it's morning where she is, by Philosophic Cat. And uh, this, this period of time that we are currently within, uh, we will be discussing a, 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 a chapter, I believe it is, from a collection of essays by uh, René Guénon, um, whose name I probably cannot pronounce. It will be on uh, carnivals. Um, and the symbolism, the significance of such things. And I expect we will roam far afield applying these insights to our current day, possibly among other things. So uh, before I um, allow Kat to introduce herself and we move on to the um, core of, of this discussion, I will briefly say, please do follow this channel, Semigog, as well as a safer space. You can do that on BitChute. Um, so I also recommend that you follow uh, me over on Odyssey, which seems to be a platform that is not without issues, but uh, has more promise, uh, certainly, than BitChute. Please follow me on Twitter, on Telegram, on Minds, on Gab. Um, and there you have it. Uh, oh, buy my books. Buy book. Buy book now. This is uh, Vinculum. You can find this on uh, Amazon under the name Oliver Perrin. It's a sci-fi story, sort of cyberpunkish, set in the year 2076 in Istanbul, where a book thief is pursued by an uh, odd sect of assassins and relentless corporate hitmen. Um, and it involves some stuff from the art of memory. There's also my collection of uh, poems. This is called Cinders from the Bloomery of Youth. You can find this on Amazon. And I recommend that you do. I am uh, here with Kat. And uh, yeah, we're going to talk about uh, Guénon. And I believe we're going to start by opening uh, with a, a reading from the chapter, which is is not a, not a long one. So uh, hopefully you can bear with us on that. While I get that pulled up on screen, um, Kat, uh, uh, please sort of introduce yourself for everyone. Of course, you've been a guest on my channel several times. I know you well. Um, most people will probably know you from your work on uh, Evola um, that's available over on your channel, as well as your uh, musical endeavors with uh, Uberfolk and uh, other uh, such projects. But please uh, uh, sort of introduce yourself for folks while I get this uh, set up and let them know where they can, where they can find you. Sure. Thanks, Al. It's great to be here. It's nice to be back again. I know we had, uh, you know, a lot of back and forth over the months being like, oh, we should do a show together. And then we just kind of both kept dropping the ball on it and coming back to it. And so here we are, finally. Indeed. Um, <laughs> but yes, you gave me a very nice introduction. There's almost nothing left for me to say. Yes, I do have a YouTube channel. Uh, most people here by now are probably familiar with that. Um, so yeah, at the moment, I'm, uh, I'm currently banned on Twitter, but that is my main social media platform. I do also have Telegram. <laughs> so um, that's where you'll find me when I eventually get permanently banned from Twitter. Yeah, because that's definitely going to happen to all of us. Yeah, I, it's, I, I can feel it coming. Yes, it is. Uh, yes, it is. Uh, it's it's glacial in its movement, but it is arriving at, uh, arriving at this point where it's going to just I only asked us an innocent down. question. <laughs> But it was an innocent question about the coof, a subject that we will certainly not broach directly this evening. But it was innocent. <laughs> Isn't it always? It is innocence itself that they wish to see destroyed with their verminous is. plotting, is it not? And it is that defilement of innocence that we shall be talking about very shortly. Yes, indeed. Something, something of a carnival, yes. Yes. Mm. <laughs> Yes. Well, is there um, anything that you would like to say specifically about our subject tonight before I read through the passage you so kindly provided? Um, no, I think let's read through the passage first so that everyone's got a context for what it is we're talking about. And then we'll uh, we'll go through it. We'll break it down and um, discuss, it, discuss it from there. OK, well, I have the uh, page views where everyone can see your fantastically precise underlining, obviously done with a straight <laughs> edge. Um, Pro you know, kind tip, of use a bookmark. <laughs> Yes, yes, indeed. Well, I, I, I of course, use um, steel rulers. Steel rulers are the only way to go uh, where I come from. Oh, wow. Now, just okay. in case you must be reading much wider books than I have. Just in case anyone's wondering, I keep all my gear down here. You know, if you need a, a slide rule or if you wish to, uh, for example, uh, roll something out on a map to figure out what the distance is. I've got all the gear here. Um, now, I will read through this, ladies and gentlemen, but I want all of you to know that I suggested that uh, Kat do this because it's always much, much more fun to have an attractive blonde reading to you than me droning away. But 
she asked specifically that I do it so that she could prepare some of her notes. And um, well, I mean, look, if I do it, I have to put my glasses back on and we already discussed what a problem that was going to be. And also you're only going to see the top of my head while I squint down at my book. <laughs> so, all right, we'll see. That's better. Actually, that's better. All right. <laughs> um, so I think uh, you can do the reading with your great uh, dramatic intonations that I know you're very good at. And I will um, sit here and people can see my face and not the top of my head. Um, Beautiful. Okay. But yeah, so just so people know, this is from, uh, it's a chapter from Rene Guénon's book, Symbols of Sacred Science. So if you do have that, uh, you're probably familiar with this chapter. Um, and the reason we're reading it out is because it's just not easy to find online. So um, anyway, take it away, Ollie. I shall, but you know what? I forgot to send this thing out on Twitter. So I'm going to do it now saying live, 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 now, now, now. Shame on me for not having done so sooner. <laughs> okay, well then... Um, uh, um, <laughs> Fiend, <laughs> Fiend J is a bad, bad man. Okay, <clears throat> so I'm going to read this out. Let me get this up on screen where you can, everyone can see this. Um, hopefully, they can follow along with this. Let me see if I can zoom this in a little bit better. All right, yeah, so hopefully people can see this. Um, and we'll try to roll through this quickly so that we can get to the discussion about it. This is entitled, The Significance of Carnivals. With regard to a particular theory of festivals formulated by a sociologist, we have pointed out that among other shortcomings, this theory wishes to reduce all festivals to a single type, constituting what may be called a, a carnival festivals, an expression which seems to us clear enough to be understood easily by everyone, since in fact, the carnival represents what still remains of it in the West today. At the time, we said that on the subject of this kind of festival, there arise questions deserving of a deeper examination. Indeed, the impression that emerges from them is always, and above all else, one of disorder in the most complete sense of this word. How then does it happen that they are to be found not only in an age such as ours, in which case they could be considered simply as one of the numerous manifestations of the general disorder, but also and even with a more ample development in traditional civilizations with which they seem at first glance to be incompatible. It would not be unprofitable to cite some specific examples, and we will mention first of all in this connection certain festivals of a truly strange character which were celebrated in the Middle Ages. The Festival of the Ass, wherein this animal, of which the properly satanic symbolism is well known in all traditions, was introduced into the very chancel of the church where it occupied the place of honor and received the most extraordinary tokens of veneration. And also the Festival of Fools, wherein the lesser clergy indulged the worst, indulged in the worst improprieties, parroting um, both the ecclesiastical hierarchy and the liturgy itself. How is it possible to explain that in such a period of which the most evident characteristic is incontestably parody and even sacrilege, how is it possible to explain that in such a period, things of which the most evident characteristic is incontestably parody and even sacrilege were not only tolerated, but in a way even given official sanction? We will also mention the Saturnalia of the ancient Romans, from which the modern carnival seems to have been directly derived, although it is in truth no longer anything but a very diminished vestige of it during these vest festivals, the slaves ordered the masters about, and the masters served the slaves. One then had the image of a truly upside-down world, wherein everything was done contrary to the normal order. Although it is commonly claimed that these festivals were a reminder of the Golden Age, this interpretation is manifestly false. For there is no question here of any sort of equality, that could, if necessary, be regarded as representing the primordial indifferentiation of social functions, insofar as is possible in present conditions. It is a question of the reversal of hierarchical relationships, which is altogether different. And such a reversal constitutes, in a general way, one of the plainest characteristics of Satanism. We should thus rather see in these something that relates to the sinister aspect of Saturn, an aspect which certainly does not pertain to him as God of the Golden Age, but on the contrary, insofar as he is now no longer anything but the fallen God of a completed period. 
It can be seen by these examples that in such festivals, there is invariably a sinister and even satanic element. And what is particularly noteworthy is that it is precisely this element that pleases the mob and excites its mirth. This is something very well suited, indeed, even more so than anything else, to giving satisfaction to the tendencies of fallen man, insofar as these tendencies urge him on to develop especially the lowest possibilities of his nature. Now, it is just this that constitutes the real raison d'etre of such festivals. It is, in short, a matter of somehow channeling these tendencies and rendering them as inoffensive as possible by giving them an opportunity to manifest themselves, but only during very brief periods and in very set circumstances. And by assigning this manifestation narrow limits, which it is not allowed to overstep. If this were not so, oh, she's got a quote back here. Uh, I'm sorry, a note to the, let's go back to this. Sorry, people, because um, um, Kat has uh, uh, marked the footnote as well. So we go back to this part where it says it does not pertain to him as of the golden age, but on the contrary, insofar as he is now no longer anything but the fallen God of a completed period. Completed period, the idea of cycles and phases will be um, familiar to those on the right, particularly those who follow Spengler. Um, this footnote eight that goes with that passage says that the ancient gods became demons in a certain manner is a fact quite generally noted. And the attitude of the Christians towards the gods of paganism is merely a particular case, but one that seems never to have been explained as it should be. But we cannot dwell further on this point, <clears throat> which would lead us too far from our subject. It is understood, of course, that this refers solely to certain cyclic conditions and does not affect or in any way modify the essential character of these same gods insofar as they symbolize non-temporally a principle of superhuman order, so that in spite of everything, their benefic aspect still subsists side by side with their accidentally malefic aspect, even when it goes completely unrecognized by those without. The astrological interpretation of Saturn could furnish a very clear example of this respect. So back to where we were, <clears throat> we were talking about the uh, <clears throat> the expression and channeling of these tendencies um, being uh, fixed within narrow limits that they're um, not permitted to overstep. And he goes on to say, if it were not so, these same tendencies for lack of the minimum satisfaction required by the present state of humanity would be at risk of exploding, so to speak and spreading their effects to the whole of existence, collectively as well as individually, causing a disorder far more serious than that which is produced only during some few days especially reserved for that purpose, and which, moreover, is all the less to be feared for being thus regularized by that very festival. For on the one hand, these days are, as it were, placed outside the normal course of things in such a way as not to exert any appreciable influence on the latter, while on the other hand, the fact that there is nothing unforeseen in these festivals in a way normalizes the disorder itself and integrates it into the total order. Apart from this general explanation, which is perfectly evident to anyone prepared to reflect, there are some useful remarks to be made concerning particularly the masquerades that play an important part in carnivals, properly speaking, and in other more or less similar festivals. And these remarks will confirm still further what we have just said. Indeed, carnival masks are generally hideous and most often evoke animal or demonic forms, so that they are like a figurative materialization of these, uh, of those lower, we might say, uh, infernal tendencies, which are allowed to be expressed. Furthermore, each person, without even being fully aware of it, will quite naturally choose from among these masks the one that best suits him, that is, the one which represents what most conforms with his own lower tendencies, so that one could say that the mask, which is supposed to hide the true face of the individual, quite to the contrary, reveals to all what the latter really carries within himself, but which he is habitually obligated to dissimulate. It is worth noting, for this throws further light on the precise character of masks, that here we have a kind of parody of the reversal, which, as we have explained elsewhere, takes place in a certain degree of initiatic development, a parody, we say, and a truly satanic counterfeit. For here, the reversal, 
is an exteriorization no longer of spirituality, but on the contrary, of the lowest possibilities of being. To conclude this survey, let us add that if festivals of this kind became more and more rare and no longer even seem able to arouse the slightest interest of the crowd, it is because in an age such as our own, they have become truly pointless. For how could there still be any question of circumscribing disorder and containing it within strictly defined limits when it is spread everywhere and is manifested constantly in all domains of human activity? Thus, considering only externals and from a purely aesthetic point of view, although one might be tempted to be satisfied with the almost complete disappearance of these festivals on account of the ugliness in which they are inevitably garbed, if one goes to the heart of the matter, this disappearance can, on the contrary, be seen as not at all reassuring, since it testifies to the fact that disorder has erupted into the entire course of existence and to its having become generalized to such a point that, in reality, we could be said to live in a sinister, perpetual carnival. <laughs> that is an observation, certainly, that... Um, I take most to heart and agree most thoroughly with. Um, so yeah, that covers the uh, the opening. You can see, a, or, or we're able just a moment ago to see just a, a touch of Cat's thumb there. Hopefully, I won't be uh, doxing her. So, um, <laughs> what were your uh, what were your sort of opening thoughts on this, Cat? Right. Um, so I think one of the first things that we have to establish here is this sort of like as above, so below principle this uh, this belief that the world has order and that this order is a reflection of the divine cosmos. And so this is the way in which uh, the traditional worldview was based upon immutable principles of structure and order that flowed down from God to man and then imbued our lives with a sense of stability, order, and, and structure. So I think one needs to begin first from this starting point to understand the concept of the carnival and um, what Gwinnon actually has to say about it. Oh, Ollie's making notes over there. <laughs> Just a couple of things I wanted to cover on reading it uh, this second time. So, yes, I, I, um, I feel you. What further, what, what more do you have to say upon this? Um, yeah. So from, from that perspective, then, he what he's talking about here, which um, you rightly put in the title for the show regarding inversion and disorder, you know, um, we have to kind of look at, you know, what does something like what does satanic actually mean when it's used in this context? And Gwinnon, basically, his position is that satanic is essentially just an inversion of order. So I think most people, when they hear satanic, they think of like demonic rituals, um, but it does mean it means a lot more than that. If you establish God as that from, as that thing from which all order and beauty and truth flows, then to understand the traditionalist worldview of what was satanic is basically to invert that which is true and good and instead elevate and even revel in the opposite of all those things. So um, instead of beauty, it's ugliness that's celebrated. And instead of truth, it's lies. And instead of order, it's chaos. And it's it's anti-hierarchy. It's, it's equality and the downward leveling that comes with all that. So something doesn't need to have pentagrams in blood to be considered satanic. Um, from Gwinnon's point of view, like our entire society these days is essentially satanic in that regard. Um, like, for example... Um, I was talking the other day with George and he uh, had mentioned to me a music video that he had seen, which was just utterly disgusting. Um, in this video, it's just, it's literally celebrating all the, you know, just the ugliness and the death and decay and everything that's just gross. And there's like this image in it with like this dead lion with rats crawling all over it. Um, I couldn't even watch it on that point. It was, just, it was disgusting to me. But, you know, instead of celebrating the regality and the nobility of the lion, um, they, they are celebrating these animals of death and disease. And like they had a bunch of cockroaches and, you know, flies and stuff in the video. Just um, why, like, why would you elevate those things over something so much more noble? And I think, you know, it's also relevant to even mention that 
the world is becoming inhospitable to all of nature's nobility. And so pretty much the only things that are even able to live in the cities that man builds are cockroaches and rats. Um, there's no room for the lions, the wolves, the elephants, any other noble creature. So what does that say about humans that we're suited to the same environment as cockroaches and rats? What does it say about the cities that we build that they're only suitable for this? And what does it say about man's modern nature that this is what he wants to build and live in, you know? So go ahead. I was just going to say, yes, it's uh, it's horrifying. Um, <laughs> yes. But did you have a final thought you wanted to throw in for that portion? No, um, I can just keep going like stream of consciousness for until somebody interrupts me. So, <laughs> well, I, there's one thing that I did want to throw in there uh, when you talked about, you know, the, the satanic and I have not looked into this for a while. So there may be parts of it that I have, um, you know, bef have become befuddled in my mind. Um, but but it is important to look at the different conceptions of um, Satan or the devil or Iblis, you know, in the uh, traditions of the book. And w from what I remember of it, you know, if someone's looked into it more recently and they want to raise hell with me in the chat, you know, um, do so. And of course, check this yourself. But, you know, so th this is going from memory. But I believe that um, Satan within the um, Jewish tradition, the, the term specifically refers to an adversary. And so the idea is that it is the adversary um, fundamentally. And that is the, the, the sense of the word. And you find different variations of it, you know, with the idea of Lucifer and the morning star, um, you know, you get some different aspects of it, depending on, you know, what aspect of the Christian tradition you, you look at, um, which you certainly have the idea of a fallen angel um, that was once among the ranks of, you know, the, the heavenly hosts. Um, you certainly have the idea in um, Islam with Iblis, um, being the greatest of all the archangels. And um, Iblis, of course, is uh, presented with <clears throat> man, <clears throat> excuse me, this mewling, crapping, stinking, decaying creature crawling across the face of the earth. And Allah tells him, you know, bend your knee to man. And this greatest of the archangels is like, jogger, please. Right. And uh, for that, he's cast out of heaven. And, uh, you know, uh, plays this role uh, as Iblis. Um, so there are, there are facets to, to this idea of um, Satan going from adversary to this idea, you know, almost of hubris and pride. You know, so you get themes like you see with, uh, with, a, with an Icarus, you know, flying too close to the sun. Um, you get the idea of... Um, something so proud that it refuses to recognize the potential inherent in the meek and the humble. So, um, yeah. And, and of course you get the business of inversions in general, you know, whether it's pop culture or not, it really doesn't matter. There's a fixed image of the satanic in our mind's eye, which is this idea of, uh, of the, um, the inverted cross, you know, the upside down cross is a sign of Satanism. You know, Damien, the omen will carry the upside down cross, you know, um, so yeah, you've got the idea of inversion. Certainly there's a, a thing I wanted to throw in here. I recommend this highly to everybody. Anybody who's into classical studies will know about it, but it's the, um, Oxford classical dictionary. It's very useful. I, when I don't have a dictionary next to my bed, I often have this because you can just open it up and read different, um, articles on, uh, different aspects of the, the classical world and the rest. Um, although I don't know what the most recent editions are like, they're probably full of the usual, um, inserted nonsense about, you know, gender roles and all that crap. But um, there's a, just a bit here on the Saturnalia because the carnival as a festival is, um, it probably falls calendrically closer to the Lupercalia. Um, but in terms of uh, what goes on with uh, the, the, the festival or celebration or whatever the hell it is, it um, attracts much more uh, properly with the Saturnalia as uh, Guénon observed. And so I wanted to um, just briefly cover that so that people will know what we're talking about here. You know, if somebody like uh, Columba is in the house with a background in the classics, you know, he'll know about this, but uh, some others won't. So 
They write, of the early history uh, of his festival, this relates to the um, Roman god Saturnus, and uh, we don't really know much uh, about him at all, so I'm going to skip over that because it's all highly speculative. But So when they, when they talk about his festival, they're referring to the god Saturnus. Uh, of the early history of his festival, nothing is known. Livy speaks as if it originated in 496 BC, which is obviously not so. At most, some modification of the ritual in the direction um, uh, of Hellenization took place then. In Cicero's day, at any rate, the festival lasted for seven days. Augustus reduced it to three. But from the reigns of uh, Gaius and Claudius, it attained five days, quite apart from the fact that everyone continued to celebrate for seven days. Seven is interesting when you talk about cycles and the rest, because that's the microcosm of sort of the seven planets, a cycle of them. We see it recapitulated in our seven days of the week, right? Um, the Saturnalia were celebrated down to the Christian age and beyond under the name of uh, Brumalia. In the uh, chronographer of AD 354, the vignette characterizing the month of December represents a person celebrating the Saturnalia. Uh, and it is in this context that the famous work of Macrobius entitled Saturnalia must be placed. The Saturnalia were the merriest festival of the year, the best of days, according to Catullus. Uh, slaves were allowed temporary liberty to do as they liked. Presents were exchanged, particularly wax candles and sigillaria. There was also a sort of mock king which is interesting when you look at traditions like Mardi Gras that have the king and queen of Mardi Gras and the different crews have their uh, kings and queens. Um, this mock king was called the uh, Saturnalicius Princeps, leader of the Saturnalia, who presided over the feasts and amusements. Uh, as a general rule, Romans at this time adopted a comportment inverting their normal conduct. The social order was inverted, slaves dined before their masters, and could allow themselves a certain insolence. Leisure wear, that being the synthesis, was worn instead of the toga, as well as the felt bonnet proper to slaves, the peleus. Um, and the time was spent eating, drinking, and playing. There is a debate about the claims of Christian writers that gladiators were linked to Saturn and that they were a form of uh, human sacrifice. So that's a that's a general picture. Um, I think with that as a background, as well as the idea of um, uh, carnival in our current day, you know, we sort of have a background to look at this full picture, you know, in the sense of it sort of having broken out of its boundaries. It's no longer a fixed holiday. You know, it's something that we find, you know, certainly in an unpleasant way surrounding us at all times and in, in all places. Um, most particularly over the last year and a half or so. But there is one last thing I want to bring up um, before I turn it over to you to share your thoughts. And that is, I do not think that we can properly consider the, uh, the, the, the carnival um, in the way that it survives today without the idea of what it is the other side of. So with Carnival, you have this period of sort of unleashing everything. And it happens immediately prior to uh, the beginning of Lent. And so with Carnival, you have the idea of, you know, eating meat and uh, the pleasures of the flesh and indulgence and um, uh, the, the, the releasing or relaxing, I should say, of... Um, rules and regulations and this sort of thing. But then it's followed by this period that is supposed to be characterized, if I remember correctly, by prayer uh, and fasting and charitable works. Um, you know, so people used to joke about it. My family's all from New Orleans and it's like, you know, it's all a party and the cop on the horse is your friend until, you know, midnight. And then at 1201, it's like, you know, Cut it, cut it off, clean it up, go home, because we're rolling into Ash Wednesday, right? And and that's an entirely different world. And I suppose one of the things that um, the satanic has built into it is the idea that you can have the one thing without the other. It's the foolishness of thinking that you can overindulge a given vice or or to relax any given set of restrictions, and it'd be just fine. Why do we need the restrictions anyway? Why can't we just do whatever we want, right? Why can't I have cake for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, mom? 
you know, there's, 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 you know, why, why can't I, uh, you know, uh, uh, fuck like a jungle beast at all times and never restrain myself or my passions or my directions and the rest. And in order to avoid making that same mistake in consideration of our subject, I think it's important to understand that there is another half of this thing that is the carnival, whatever form it happens to have taken today. And in considering how um, it unfolds itself around us now in all its squalor, um, I think that we should also be aware that lurking just behind the scenes comes the desert of Lent, um, I think almost unavoidably. And it's no accident, I think, that Ramadan, which is also characterized by fasting, that word originally meant the hot month. And so now it moves around because it's associated with a lunar calendar um, as in the same way that many of the Catholic holidays are, where they'll, they'll change their date, you know, uh, across different years. But um, there is something to being hammered in the desert, you know, in the copper basin beneath the, the blinding light of the sun and burnt. Um, and I don't think it's an accident that they refer to the desert of Lent and you've got the idea of fasting and Ramadan itself is the hot month. So when we think of this abandonment to the senses and the passions, I think we should also uh, be aware of this, this other element that is always called forth like a counter positive. You know, if you have a bully, a bully can't exist without the coward. If the bully really is so fully the bully, it's going to like almost like a vacuum of expectation. It's going to draw this other thing to it to complete itself, just like a coward will necessarily across time in interpersonal relations, draw to it the bully that it needs so that its lessons can be uh, realized. In a similar way, I think that this carnival is going to be calling forth a time of penitence and reflection um, of a course quite naturally. Yeah, um, I mean, carnivals basically represent the antithesis of structured order. And, you know, it, th there was a way in which they, they tried to make the carnivals as sacrilegious and offensive as possible, you know, just defiling the sacraments, defiling children or uh, animals, other innocent and pure things. There's this uh, this revelry in, in defilement of that which is good and pure. And it was often like just the most revolting things they could think of in some cases. Um, but you know, I think in order, in order for anything, like in order to triumph over evil and chaos, you know, you have to have it there in the first place. If you never see evil and chaos, you know, how do you know what you need to triumph over or why it's important? So it wasn't that these ancient societies didn't know evil. They they did have a heavy religious culture in many cases, but you have to remember that chaos is always just a step away. And chaos is eternal too, just like order. But in the material world, chaos naturally has the upper hand. So order takes this constant vigilance to maintain. And there would have been a lot of places in the world at any given time that would have just been totally submerged in chaos and evil and death and debauchery. And so like these ancient city states would have been uh, more the exception than the rule. Um, these little pockets of attempts at order in a disordered world. So they were well aware of the barbarism that man can so easily fall into. It's a, it's a very easy slide downward, but it's a hard climb up. And um you know, allowing allowing these festivals where debauchery was allowed within defined limits. Um, it's much like the relationship between Shiva and Shakti. So in for those who aren't familiar with the concept, I've talked about it a fair bit, but if you're if you don't follow my work, maybe it's new to you. So it's this idea that Shakti um, is the feminine principle. She's kind of just like unrestrained power. And Shiva's the masculine principle who's almost like the lightning rod that grounds that power but has no power in itself. And it's the union between those things that allows power to be channeled um, effectively and constructively. So, you know, instead of allowing Shakti to spin into this frenzy of destructive energy and unrestrained chaos, um, the carnival's allowing this uh, instead to spin in a structured manner uh, within a certain uh, framework that allows the energy to be expressed in a way that's not damaging. And 
when Shakti dances out of control, she does become destructive. And this is what we see in the modern era. We live in an era where Shiva is asleep and the feminine principle has run amok. So it's really no surprise that we've come to live in a clown world because the feminine principle is that chaotic principle and it needs limits in order to be something positive. Just as Shiva is powerless himself without Shakti, uh, you know, so too would a society that didn't allow any expression of the chaotic nature it would be just as unbalanced and unhealthy. So there's a way in which the carnival allows the lower nature of the masses to express themselves. Um, the masses as a group uh, were generally, were always considered feminine in nature. Um, in horary astrology, the masses are actually represented by the moon, the lunar principle. And when these lower tendencies are allowed to be expressed and observed, but in a way that contains a bit of mockery, you know, not not to scorn, but um, kind of viewed through the lens of parody, of being a bit ridiculous and silly um, because of this. Instead, the person with those tendencies within them um, to not see them expressed at all, and then they start to romanticize that aspect of themselves, or they feel like there's an unrequited part of themselves that hasn't been allowed out. And sometimes the thing that is suppressed is what the person most starts to identify with. You know, like, how dare you tell me that I can't express this part of me? Therefore, I'm going to make it all that I am. Um, it's a little bit like um, kind of how like the LGBT movement looks for any inkling of non-binary sexual expression in, in someone and then tries to present it to the unwitting youth that, it's something that's being repressed by the oppression of the cisgenders. And so it has that perception of having that mystery, that part of you that's not allowed, uh, that's forbidden, and it's being suppressed by society or your parents or being told that they're ugly or something's not right about them because they're not allowed expression in a proper context. That's the message they're sold. Well, the carnival allows these inversions of normalcy in order to have their day where they would be kind of reveled in, but held up to ridicule in the in the proper way so that it could be seen for what it is. It's it's a part of our nature that does exist, but it is also a rebellion against God's order. And therefore, I think it would give the attendees of the carnival kind of an acknowledgement that the established hierarchy understood these elements of human nature and allowed them to be expressed and understood, but, you know, more in the context of being inversions of God's order, almost like, it's kind of like if you raise children where you never discuss any sexuality with them and refuse to acknowledge that that's part of them and that they'll come across it someday versus, you know, the healthy way of acknowledging it is just part of the human experience so that when they do encounter it, as they get older, they have some frame of reference for how to understand it from people um, that they trust. And um, there's a footnote in the book um, that speaks to this kind of, um, I'm going to have to put on my glasses now. <laughs> so much for trying to avoid that. Um, it is, yeah, footnote 10. It says, at the end of the Middle Ages, when the grotesque festivals mentioned were suppressed or fell into disuse, there occurred an expansion of sorcery completely out of proportion with what had been seen in previous centuries. These two facts are quite directly connected. And although this connection is not generally noticed, which moreover is all the more surprising in that there are several quite striking resemblances between such festivals and the witches' Sabbath, where everything is done backwards. That's really interesting what he's saying, this um, this expansion of sorcery is spilling out at the time when the carnivals became suppressed. Um, and so when you, like when you suppress something that wants to be expressed, all that's going to happen is it just kind of gets bottled up and then explodes outwards. And when there's no longer that framework of the carnival for that expression in which, you know, has those clearly defined rules, this is when we celebrate it. Um, this is how it's done, and this is when it's when it ends, and we go back to order. Um, it just spills out into all of society and just affect, infects everything. You know, nobody wants to go to a carnival anymore because it's like 
you don't need to go to a carnival to see the bearded lady, right? <laughs> they're, they're just everywhere in society. It's kind of what he's saying about living in like this, this sinister perpetual carnival. Yes, there is no shortage of a sinister perpetual carnival. Um, my, my favorite thing to do is to look at the novelty masks that are now uh, available to us. Um, so it's kind of like a carnival all day long, um, you know, as we as we wear our coof masks to show our subjugation with our, you know, our pictured feed bags. This is a personal favorite of mine. You know, what's not to like about that? You know, I mean, why would I not want to wear the um, the testicle mask? You know, har, har, har. That's so funny. Gosh, guys, you know, and, and what are people really saying with these uh, masks? You know, what, what, what do they tell you about themselves? That's that's what's so interesting to me when I look at things, because I saw this once uh, at Halloween. Like when, when I would go out on, on Halloween, I would just constantly there'd be a, a woman dressed up like a devil, a sexy devil. And she'd have a little plastic pitchfork and her little horns. Right? They're sexy. always sexy costumes, right? Right. The sexy devil or the sexy nurse. Right. Um, and there, there are other ones that I could, you know, I, I, I could think a bit here and probably would be even more dark. But um, invariably, when people put those masks on, and I think uh, Gwynon was talking about this, and, and, and you would think that on the surface, superficially, I should say, you would think that they are that this practice is hiding what they are, when in fact, really what it's doing um, as I was just talking about, is pointing out exactly what they are, um, and and Halloween is very much like that. If you if you want to understand the psychological issues that somebody is confronted with, watch what they dress up for um, uh, as uh, on Halloween, which is another one of these uh, situations where you're supposed to have a vent, a release that will happen at a yeah. particular time, and and now without any sort of um, constraint, any sort of setting aside of the one time and place for one thing and this other time and place for another, we get the whole idea of an inversion of social order. So I just recently saw a picture that somebody took when they were driving around in San Francisco and it's um, two people, uh, forgive me, fucking like dogs in the street between two parked cars. Um, and of course they're wearing their little COVID masks. And you just endlessly see this attempt to remove all restrictions and I think one of the points that I wanted to make here that I was laying all this out as background for is that it it even takes away the pleasure inherent in the transgression. Yeah. I mean, basically, it's like if you have nothing to eat but ice cream all day long, pretty soon you're puking and you're like, I have no interest in it. I think it was in one passage of Giordano Bruno's where he was talking about how you need the seasons. You know, because and it's not a, you know, certainly not any kind of observation that's unique to him. But the idea is that, you know, by the time you've been long enough in winter, you're about ready for summer. And by the, the time you've been in summer long enough, you're about ready for fall and then winter. You know, it is moving through these things that makes the other thing desirable and necessary. But instead, we've just got this this kicked out gutless bag of human experience that's that's lying on the ground that that no longer can even sit up straight because there's nothing left in it it's like the stuffing's been torn out of all of these things that we would otherwise approach as a as, as something desirable even if it was forbidden because there's no distinction you know they've pushed the idea of the grotesque and the absurd so far that you know it's very easy to turn on your social media and see some creature in a skirt um, you know, haranguing someone about how they're truly a woman and um, and they deserve to be treated that way. And the whole thing is just so appallingly farcical that you just have to stop and wait. And you're like, does this, does this keep going? Does this get worse? It certainly seems that it is uh, likely uh, to do so. And everything that we've experienced thus far points out that, that it will uh, indeed get worse. And uh, let, let me see here what else that I, I wanted to cover. I had something about the um, the, the Halloween costumes. Yes, the, the aspect of the um, the psychology of it, too, is something that I want to cover. But but since you're back before I do that, so mm -hmm. I'm not monopolizing this, is there anything you wanted to say about this previous part? 
Yeah, sorry, I just had to, uh, I didn't realize it, but my computer wasn't actually charging. So I had to go and put it in a different plug. <laughs> but it's better now. I'm not going anywhere Excellent. for a while now. But it's the next... got like this 10% left. I was like, what? <laughs> yeah, that would be um... awkward. Awkward. <laughs> awkward cat just disappeared. Boomer power malfunction. But yes. <laughs> Um, yeah, like on the subject of masks, I actually find it really fascinating. It's, um, you know, this concept that he's talking about, where people are choosing the mask that best reflects their inner nature, you know, it's like the mask becomes the face and the face becomes the mask. So the face you're presenting out in public every day isn't really you, it's what you want people to think you are. But you know, what is reflected on the inside and so I'm like, obviously, the best example is, you know, what you were showing with all the silly masks that people wear now um, with the whole like mask mandates and stuff. What interests me is people who wear masks when they don't have to, like they're in their car alone. What does that say about this person's inner nature? You know, there are people that I've seen on social media or even people I've heard um, talking just in real life saying that they feel more comfortable and secure with the mask and they continue to wear it even if they're not required to. So it's kind of like, you know, what if when you looked in the mirror, it showed your inner beauty instead of your outer beauty? Would you still want to see it? Um, if In many cases, there's a bit of a disconnect going on there. There's... um. You know, people who tattoo and pierce themselves all over, no offense, because I know you're tattooed and everything, but, you know, they're expressing something of their character in that. Or there's people who don't take care of their health. They're expressing something of their inner nature, too. And so people's appearances reveal their inner nature. And sometimes that inner nature is revealed to be revolting. It's kind of that basic principle you see in the memes that, you know, physiognomy is real. What Very. does it say then? If you prefer to have no face, isn't it true that your resting face shows the contents of your mind? Like resting bitch face. I have resting bitch face. I'm probably actually a bitch. Like I don't mean to be, but I like, I wish I wasn't. It's something I need to work on, but sometimes I have resting bitch face. And you know, you're aware of this because you see other people's faces all the time. And then so when you see what other people's faces express, you realize, oh, well, my own face might be showing my own depression or my bitterness or confusion. If that's what your face shows, then maybe you would prefer to hide behind a mask so that no one can see the contents of your mind. Or the other thing I considered is that it might also suggest that you have a blankness of mind. And I think this is probably... Uh, applying to the majority of the people who wear masks, because even before people wear masks, you could just see how brain dead people looked. Like if you're standing, like I'd be standing in line, like at the supermarket or something, I'll just like look around at people or you know, waiting at the train station or something. And I'm looking around and it's like, there. it's not that they look like they're in despair, but there's just like a complete, yes, yes. There's this complete lack of awareness of what their predicament is in life. And all they know at that moment is that they're not consuming anything and they're not being entertained. And they're just kind of enduring life until the next moment in which they can consume something or be entertained. And their eyes looked totally soulless already. So wearing this mask is the perfect expression for the empty face they were already wearing, expressing their very empty mind. The kind of people who choose to wear a mask are in some ways um, choosing the most appropriate face for themselves. I mean, they don't, if there's nothing going on up there, what do you need a face for, really? Yeah, there is something to it as well that's infantile. There's something, because I've noticed I very seldom um, uh, put masks on or I have to wear them. There's no mask mandate in my state. Um, but when I go to the post office, just because I don't want to hear shit from people, you know, I just put the damn thing on, go in and do it. But as soon as I come out, my my whole face is wet from the condensed moisture. Yeah. It's just repulsive. And when what you get is, you know, how they talk about if a dog's healthy, you know, its nose is wet. There's a certain amount of having moisture up in here that traps molecules and allows the scent function to work better, which is why animals have wet scents to actually pick up the crap that's in the air so that they can they can get it. And there is very much a thing of the infant where the mouth and the nose are sort of coming together as one. 
you know, the small infant always has snot running out of its nose and into its mouth. And it's sort of reading its own codes as is blurble, you know, and its own snot. And there's an infantile thing of the moisture and the snurfling animal snoutishness of the <laughs> of the mask, the the the, the sagging stinking feedback where you're 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 simultaneously breathing and drinking your own recycled waste, your effluvium. There's something sick and infantile uh, about that that I think is um, is significant. But there's another dimension going on, you know, with this idea of carnival to just kind of shift gears into another area. This is sort of I wanted to mention as a follow on thing from the uh, the Halloween business. Is it <clears throat> if 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 a certain type of expression is reserved for certain times and places, then already inherent in that is the fact that you have a range of different things you can do, different places you can be, different emotional stances you can take, different instances of interpersonal relationships. So there's a realm of human expression. But when whatever this crap is sort of, you know, overflows the dikes that are designed to contain the sewage and you're sort of like wallowing in sewage all the time um, i'm going to shift gears with metaphor here as well suddenly you've got less room for expression there's there's you do not have these these differences it's like when i was learning um percussion and drumming early on you know you just want to play loud all the time and then as soon as you get near real musicians they're like you do realize that there's the option of playing something loud and then not being loud so that there's difference and there's dynamism and you're kind of like really and in the absence of that if your amplifier goes to 11 at all times and never gets turned down then there's this whole realm of expression that you've been deprived of I'm, I'm jumping over to, to various metaphors, but I'll, I'll narrow it down here. The same thing happens in human interpersonal relationships. And if you don't have the idea of restraint in certain areas, then there's the whole idea of the indulgence disappears as well. I used to hang out in strip clubs when I was young because I live in a city with more strip clubs than any other place on earth. Um, and I, yeah, I just, we, we don't have to go into all of that, but I know far more about the inside of strip clubs than that anybody should know. Um, and one of the things that you find is that strippers aren't naked. They're never naked. No matter how much they take off, they're never naked. There's just a certain point you get at when you're looking at a stripper and you're like, is that boot leather? I'm just looking at more fucking boot leather because there's no actual nakedness. It's all been removed. It's gone. It's a farce. It's absurd. Um, similarly with, um, interpersonal relationships, when you cut out all this different range of interaction that might be, for example, like uh, interaction between two people based on respect or interaction between two people based on the fact that one is a knowledgeable mentor and the other one isn't and therefore shuts up and listens, right? Um, or the idea that they're women who are not simply um, sexual objects, right? Or that a woman who's not a sexual object could actually be something besides an indulgent mother, right? Like, so it's, there's something there besides Madonna and whore, right? Um, and I've seen that in my own life. You know, I have a, a family member who's just a fucking idiot and is so deprived of social interaction. I've noticed this, I've seen it. It's really striking and also repulsive, but he is so deprived of all the other levels of human interaction because he's so unpleasant and spends his time alone that whatever person remains that he does have some interaction with, he tries to pump all human interaction, the whole range of experiences through that one last remaining interpersonal lifeline. So it's like, imagine someone who, um, who isn't getting laid and doesn't have a girlfriend who's like, you know, 60 years old and has a late seventies mom. And yet with that canvas to work with, he has to paint it with his own personal problems that would otherwise be like resolved with a girlfriend. Like you'd have a jealous moment that your mom didn't call you up and invite you to something. And you're like, I'm not entirely sure that this is an appropriate interaction with your mom. Right. And yet they're so unconscious of 
the condition in which they find themselves, that they're oblivious to that. And, and I know that sounds like a, a kind of odd, very specific thing, but I wanted to call it out because I've noticed it before. I think probably many people watching have noticed this before where they're, they're like doing their own thing. And, you know, uh, particularly with the online crap, God help you all. If you indulge it, I foolishly did in the past, you meet somebody, everybody sort of presents their own little thing. And then you go off and you meet on a date. And sometimes you'll just kind of look up and you'll be like, Oh my God, did I, am I, let me, let me check this brochure again. Am I, am I where I'm supposed to, are you the person, is this a date or, is this some weird thing for you to be resentful when I've known you for five minutes and yet you're already taking, uh, taking offense? I'm not, I'm not articulating this very well, but you'll find that people who have no business getting into a psychodrama with you have suddenly cast you for some role that not only has nothing to do with you, it has nothing to do with the superficial aspects of the social interaction that we're talking about. And I, I, I realize I've gone rather far afield, but it, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm kind it, of like, so what are you saying, Ali? Are you trying to say that dating you is like going to a carnival? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm trying to say that in a situation where the full range of human interaction has been removed, look at it like this. You have nothing to, just like the person I mentioned who would have to paint his relationship with his mother based upon a ton of unresolved stuff that properly should have been played out somewhere else, like resentment in the workplace or being dissatisfied with your sexual partner, whatever it is. Suddenly the only canvas he has to paint on is his relationship with his mother. And it's almost in some ways obscene just on its surface features. It's so you look at it and you're like, what? Similarly, if you have nothing but a giant inverted carnival, that encourages your basis desires. And that's the only avenue you have for self-expression. It looks similarly obscene when you, for example, start to, like I just saw it recently on Twitter. They're like, well, has the time come that we as responsible parents begin to create pornography that's appropriate for younger people to show them what consent is like and what the mature sex role should be? That's exactly my point. It's the same kind of thing. When the expression is limited to this one range, all these things that properly belong somewhere else have to take place in this perverse shitscape because they're given no other stage upon which to unfold and sort of flower and form their reactions and the experiences and the learning. So that that is a kind of horrific thing about it as well. Yeah, it's, I mean, we basically live now in a scenario where the whole world is in total chaos and the remaining expressions of order are basically just like put into museums as like historical curiosities. People don't even know why they should preserve order because they never see it and don't understand it. It's like the opposite of what the carnival was achieving. You know, if you don't if you don't show people what chaos and evil looks like, they don't understand why they need to work so hard to fight against it. But now it's the opposite. People now don't understand why they should fight for order because they never see it. They don't know what it looks like. Um, kind of like one of the first things that happens is that, you know, when society becomes such a clown world where, where these elements have been, been freed from the confines of, of the festival grounds and have bled out into the entire society, um, and the whole civilization has become corrupted from it. And initially, when this process is underway, there seems to still be a romanticization of order through art and literature. Um, it allows the old order to still be expressed, but now it's reached the point where they don't even allow that kind of art to be made anymore. When, when was the last time you saw a movie that wasn't full of SJW propaganda? Like movies like The Lord of the Rings could not be made today. Um, Disney films now where they used to still even have some, I know a lot of people have strong opinions about Disney and stuff. I'm sorry if you don't like Disney, but I grew up with Disney. I love Disney and my lifelong goal was always to be a Disney princess. And I don't care what anybody thinks of that because <laughs> that's what I was born for. <laughs> but, you know, there, I remember like um, The Lion King. I went to see like the live action film of it and, you know, re reminded me what the cartoon was like and everything. Like that's actually quite a traditional film in many ways. It's kind of a story of silver age kingship in a way. 
um, Disney doesn't make movies like that anymore. You know, now Disney's under a lot of pressure to make movies with uh, lesbian Disney princesses who uh, never fall in love and um, and just to promote all this SJW propaganda to children. So this chaotic element has become so dominant now that it has completely eclipsed any remnant of order. Um, I, eventually there's gonna come a day where they take all this, uh, all these old relics out of museums too, because they don't want people knowing about that part of history. They'll, you know, they'll say, oh, we need to destroy these relics because they're representative of patriarchy and inequality and stuff. But I mean, really what they're offended by is the concept of order and hierarchy. And I mean, sometimes when you want to illustrate a point, you, you do need to use its opposite. That's kind of what the purpose of the carnival was. If you have no idea what the antithesis of order is, you know, how can you even understand order properly? You need to know, just like if you can't properly understand what light is if you don't understand dark. Um, but, you know, it shows it shows how destructive human nature can be if it had no limits. And allowing that element of chaos to be observed in a controlled setting is the best way to keep those forces at bay and to serve as an illustrative exercise so that people can see that chaos without having to live in it or actually you know, approach the gates of hell. And they can still understand why they need to be diligent. But now we're in a world where we've not only approached the gates of hell, we've surpassed it and they've burnt everything behind us so that we can't even look back and see what heaven looked like. Um, so you know where where does that where does that even leave us today? I would say it, uh, I, I can see signs of where they would like it to leave us. You know, take a look at the Purge series. You know, where you've got these movies and they're just horrifically anti-white. I mean, frankly, you just you watch them, particularly this last one, the Forever Purge, which is rather relevant to our discussion. You know, the Purge, but it goes on always, right? And the characters that they set up in it are a bunch of, you know, evil white people who treat immigrants terribly, you know, and they roll around in masks and everybody's murdering each other. You know, it's the forever purge. And the purge is very much the idea that the lowest can attack the highest, you know, the old moral order is inverted. And, and that's what they show us. It's the forever carnival, you know, and it's really, it's just... It's like an orchestra of the puke hitting the pavement, you know, there's just nothing but the, the wet sounds of, you know, masturbation and vomiting that surround us on all sides as these people come, you know, tracking puke up and down the street and in and out of your house with their masks on. Um, it's just, it's, it's horrible. It's on all sides. And you can see if you sort of pick it apart in terms of the archetypes, you can see them activating. So, you know, you have the idea of the clown and its mask. But for some years now, we've had the, the corresponding archetype of the creepy clown, you know, even... Um, embodied in certain movies, you know, that'll be looking at you. I from have to stormer. interject and say all clowns are creepy. There are no exceptions. <laughs> they are all creepy. I do think, may, correct me if I'm wrong, because you might actually know more than I do. Um, but clowns, are they not something of a descendant from jesters? And jesters were, in a sense, like a mockery of the king? Well, there, there are a number of different... Um, routes that they take um and uh, uh, many of them come from comedia del arte um and the, i've looked into it and i cannot remember the subdivisions but there are a number of specific subdivisions in the archetypal characters that you see in comedia del arte and one of the i believe in comedia del arte you have the the harlequin right but there's there's another specific character that is not the harlequin that if i'm remembering correctly gives rise to the clown but you have the idea of the fool which has an aspect of the clown and the fool is certainly tied to the, the idea of the court jester, but that was a person who, who inverted things. He was like the office of the permanent Saturnalia in the sense that he was the one who, so we are told, although I doubt it was often true, was able to speak his mind to the King, right? Because he was the, he was the odd looking dwarf or whatever who made everyone laugh, but, but he operated it within a different role that permitted him the freedom to speak his mind. Um, but it's a, the idea of the clown as we see it today is a little bit distinct from that, although they have some overlapping historical strands. Um, you've also got the idea of the sad face and the happy face, which you see consistently expressed with the idea of the clown. Um, we, you get the, 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 the idea of the joker and, and also the masked with face. Masks. 
Yes, the, the right. sad and, and happy masks. Fort drama, yes, and the sort of Dionysian art. And of course, the whole idea of Dionysius, if you want me to just sum up the secret mystery of Dionysius, mm -hmm. it's the idea that the spirit, like we talk about alcoholic spirits, I'll just tell you for free, other people would have to go look for it. The idea is that the spirit itself lies within the grape, which has a flesh of its own, and it comes out with sort of a reddish color, of course, depending on the grape, right? But the thing is, if you crush the body, it releases the soul, which is the spirit. And the spirit is itself a kind of intoxication. And we call the drinks spirits, like alcoholic spirits, right? Um, and so the idea was there is a metaphor within drinking the fruit of the crushed grape that intoxicates and the idea of the spirit um, extending beyond an intoxicating way the confines of the mortal flesh. And there are probably aspects of that bound up in the myth of the Maynets tearing apart um, men when they reach their uh, frenzy. So, yeah, there is that. Mm, interesting. Yeah. So I see a lot of this stuff reflected in the um, in film. So we get the Joker, right, with the masks. Um, and of course, he's supposed to be, you know, frowning in some cases and smiling in others. So you see the stuff where, you know, turn that frown upside down, right? And so mm -hmm. you get the idea of the emotional thing. You get the idea of um, the clowns and jesters. And of course, what's the whole thing with superhero movies? It's a bunch of people running around in ridiculous costumes with masks on. It's like at every turn, people are either wearing, you know, koof masks or superhero masks or the mask of whatever assumed persona. I mean, lo look at the business with um, the, the persona just, of course, means mask in its original form. Look at the business of, uh, of uh, you know, women saying that they're men and men saying that they're women. And, you know, I identify as black, you know. Um, they're well, all really just a series of masks. Yeah, like, and in particular, like the whole like men identifying as women thing is if they think that being a woman just means wearing the right clothes and putting, painting on a face. Um, and I notice with the people who um, seem most eager to wear masks, you know, they're often like the rainbow hair brigade um, and people who like there's like this grasping at a personality there. Like they understand on some level that they're supposed to have a personality. They don't really. But it's almost like they think that if they just put on the right costume, the personality will come. You know, it's a little bit of a LARP. I've even said this in regards to like the whole like trad LARPy thing where like women think that in order to grasp at their femininity that they need to just dress and present themselves physically in a certain way and then the femininity will come and it's, you know, the whole concept is just putting the cart before the horse. The essence, the internal essence should generate what is outward, but there seems to be this phenomenon in the world from like it's not even just like one particular ideological camp. It's like everybody seems to think that they need to put on the mask and the costume and then the inner essence will come. But even if the inner essence doesn't come, maybe they can just fake it and other people will believe that they have that essence. You know, this is why I'm like so anti-LARPing because it's like, well, at what point do you convince yourself that you have this personality, but you haven't actually developed it? And speaking of person, well, did I cut you off there? No, go ahead. Speaking of personalities, I've talked about this in the past. There is a, a, a definite aspect of the um, the personae in plural, the different personas, um, and the way in which they go to make a personality. Now, of course, persona means mask. That's literally its etymological derivation. And so we talk about um, personae which are sort of the masks or faces that we present to people. And as I've discussed in the past and based on, you know, Tim talking to me about it years ago, you know, if you're trying to pick up a woman, you're going to have a certain face you present. If you're trying to go for a bank loan, you're going to have a very different face you present. I mean, unless you happen to be really turned on by the loan officer, you know, likewise, if you get pulled over by a cop, there's a certain yes, sir, yes, ma'am, no, sir, kind of, you know, thing you do. Turn on the dome light in your car. Make sure your hands are visible on the steering wheel. You know, do you mind if I reach my, for my wallet, officer? You know, yes, I'll do it very slowly, officer. Right? These, each of the, this is a different persona. When you're talking to your grandmother or grandfather, different persona. 
And that is the clue that tells you that what these persona are for, they serve functions, very important ones. If you are capable of acting professional, like when you sit down in a little chair and they're like, slob the knob a little bit and you're like, oh, do I have to? They're like, do you want the job? Uh, I do. Okay, well, suck it. They don't say that. What they say is, why do you feel you're right for this job? And you're like, oh my gosh, I've just always wanted to have this job. And I feel like it's going to be the most incredible combination to actually be here and be able to be on your team. And they're like, you're sucking it good. I think we'll give you this job, right? That's a certain persona that you have to present. Likewise with the police. Likewise, when you're up there for jury duty, they serve a function. They get you things. The thing is that these persona come online when you're a child, which is why you see them outside playing. Or once upon a time you did, I don't know what they're doing now. They're, I, I don't even want to know what kids play with or how they play. I'd probably find it horrifying and I, would, I have to go swallow a gun barrel. Just joking. Um, but they play games related to their different personas. And often it'll be associated with like job roles. So when they're play, they'll be like, okay, I'm going to be the princess and you can be the knight, right? This is probably all gone now. Now they're like, I'm going to be the transgender, you know, whatever. But once upon a time, it was like, I'm going to be the unicorn. And okay, you know, can I ride you, unicorn? No, don't hurt my back, Billy, right? They'd have roles they play. And as they got older, they would say things like, well, what are you going to be when you grow up? I'm going to be an astronaut, you know? I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a soldier, right? Or I'm going to be a, I'm going to be a, uh, fill in the blank, right? They, but they picked those roles based on them seeming to be desirable and to earn them something, to give them something by playing that role in, in their life. You don't see them like when you go out and talk to little eight-year-old kids, they're like, what are you going to be, Johnny? Well, I'm going to be a bum, you know? Or they don't say, oh, I'm going to be a crack addict. That'll be great. You know, I'm going to be a quadriplegic. Wouldn't you like to be a quadriplegic, Sally? No, they, cho they choose the roles that they hope to play based upon the success and advantage that they will provide. Now, the mm -hmm. thing is, in a normal world, one that is not as poisoned with the, the sewage overflowing the dikes, as I've mentioned, um, there's a natural feedback mechanism. So if like I'm an idiot and I hold up a pistol like this and shoot like this while grabbing my, my man business with the other hand and showing my gold teeth while I shoot, there's going to be problems. Like the gun doesn't recoil properly. It doesn't return to sight picture properly, right? You, maybe with some pistols, you'll be more likely to have a jam if, you know, the si slide cycles and it's turned sideways, whatever. The gun doesn't work as well, which means if you ever have to use it, you're more likely not to hit what you need to and you're going to get shot and die. Life gives you that natural feedback. But we're in a situation where we don't have that natural feedback. The very world is a crescendo. I'm bringing the elements together. Can you feel it, ladies and gentlemen? The very world itself, insofar as it is mediated, is itself masked. We are masked from the consequences of our own actions. We can present absurd behavior like calling all women bitches and holding guns sideways as though it's desirable because I've watched so many commercials. I know if I act that way, I'm suddenly going to have a Mercedes and women will just swoon because I've seen it on TV. That's what happens, right? Women love it when you call them bitches and you and your friends stand around smoking blunts over a pool table. That's what women, what woman isn't seeking that, right? We cannot get the feedback relative to the things that we are doing in order to discover them as not being successful, not being adaptive, not conferring survival advantage, which is why I brought up that whole thing about persona and kids in the first place, because they're after a particular mask as a social mechanism for interaction and it's supposed to confer advantage, right? But because we don't see the results because the world itself is masked, the, the world itself is sunk in this obscene carnival, the mediation prevents us from seeing what's reality. You know, you, you, you have people with little TikTok filters over them that put little unicorn stars around their heads and shit. Or, you know, uh, women on dating sites who put their bodies through some kind of weird photographic filter that makes them look like they're wearing a corset. You know, there's, it's all a lie. And so we're deprived of the feedback mechanism. I mean, think about someone with a mask on their face. You don't get to see the cues that indicate emotional state, right? There's a slight furrowing of my brow now. That means that I might not be following what's going on or I might purse my lips slightly. Hmm. Yeah. These signals are covered by this mask, which presents a falsehood in its place. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm, 
I'm sorry to be ranting off in this direction, but I, I feel like the whole thing is it, the, the, the surfaces are hidden and, and it's, it's all come to, um, to nonsense. We're prevented from seeing the consequences of our own actions by this. Now, I'll give you a chance to respond. I'm gonna turn off um, 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 my camera just here for a moment. I have to go and um, see why someone was just uh, ringing my doorbell, but I can hear you. I've got, I'm gonna put on my um, mobile sure. uh, headset. So, so speak for a moment, please. I will, yes. So in regards to what you were saying about, um, you know, the persona and such, because we live in this clown world, in this perpetual sinister carnival, I do love that turn of phrase, um, we have to wear a mask in order to, to be in this society, just like you need a mask if you go to an actual carnival. Um, but there's a way in which, you know, I think because we're living in a world that is, you know, necessarily, at least from the philosophies that I follow, we're falling into illusion here anyway. So everything we present about ourselves in this world is a mask. Like even, even just like our physical bodies are a mask or our sense of identity in some ways. But what you seem to have with a lot of people is that in their grasping for a persona and you know, all the implications that come with that in terms of a, a persona being something of a mask. I mean, they're grasping at that for a sense of identity because our society really doesn't provide any pathway whatsoever for people to find identity within their own souls and within their connection to the divine. Um, so if you're going to be living in clown world, um, what other option do you have but to constantly be cycling through different masks, whether it's an Instagram filter or um, a, a COVID mask or, um, you know, even like the, the masks that we put on just to be doing this stream. Like, to some extent, it's like, well, how we present ourselves here on YouTube, is that really all of who we are? Is that encompassing all of our personalities? No, it's just one facet of it, you know. Um, I, I have to put on kind of like my, my more academic hat to come in and speak on YouTube like this, but that's not how I am in the rest of my life necessarily. So is that a mask or is it just one facet of who I am? I mean, I would, I would even almost argue that there's a little bit of both going on, but like, you know, who you, who a person is at their essence has nothing to do with any of this material illusory way in which we present ourselves and show up in this world. Well, uh, I should tell everybody, I, I don't know what was going on. It's too late for a damn delivery. It's like, you know, it was 10, 15, 10, 20 here when I heard that. Um, it was your drug dealer. No, <laughs> no, in, <laughs> no, indeed. Like I would ever have a drug dealer come to my house. Hell no. Hell we no. All know, we know it was something degenerate. No, We've already no. established that your life is a carnival. I would, I would go I'm and just I will momentarily go and roll myself a cigarette openly in my degenerate fashion and allow yeah. you to speak again while I go get it. But um, yeah, there's something about that business with the masks. Remember what I brought up about the the idea of them having a function. They serve a purpose, right? There's there's a reason why you don't. If you're a mother and you're wired right, you're not showing your sexual come hither face to your children. They're supposed to be compartmentalized aspects of your personality for good and sufficient reason. Likewise, you're not gonna show it to your grandma, right? These are not, why? All it would do would interfere, it creates static. It, it, that is not the place for that thing. However, there is a place for that thing when you're trying to chase down a mate, right? And back to the examples of dealing with a cop or a bank loan or whatever, they serve a function. Now see, what's important about this model is that the personae are like, or personas are like, they're facets of the ego expressing itself. So you don't have to get into, you know, a Freudian framework or whatever. You could just consider the ego, the I, right? Latin meaning I, like me, I. Um, it's a sense of self, but it's composed of these different facets that you can apply. And I have seen in my own um, experience to my own satisfaction, and I've read in um, some of the psychological literature that very often what causes an ego to shatter and to lose its cohesion 
is some experience that is so shocking or otherwise upsets the worldview so thoroughly that somehow the the individual personae break out and they're not held any longer by an eye that has a sense of itself, right? Something happened to you that shocked you so much that destroyed your view of the world, your, your understanding of reality so thoroughly that it sort of cracked. And so your vision of reality corresponds to some extent with your understanding of yourself and your place in the world. And so there's no longer any specific thing available to knit the different personae that would be deployed at will like a like masks that you can hold up at different times, or I sometimes think of them as trump cards, right? Each one being a different personality that you hold up or play on the deck, uh, play out of your deck on the table in a given circumstance. And so if that understanding of the self is shattered, the persona roam free. And we are told that such things happen with schizophrenia, like, oh, well, I'm, you know, I'm this personality over here. Well, let's multiple personality disorder, let's say more specifically. Um, so you're shuffling between your different faces, but because of whatever shock or trauma or brain chemistry issues are there, you no longer have the ability to weld them together into a coherent whole. And instead you just shuffle between these faces that aren't even fully conscious of the others. And I've seen it before when people got really high around me, you'd be talking to them and they're just stoned out of their mind. And, and I'd watch them. I'm like, wow, you don't have enough going up here to be high and stay whole. Right. And you'd look at them and I'd, I'd see them. It was weird. They'd like they'd be talking like they're in some sort of personality thing. They'd be presenting a certain kind of face, particularly I'd see, you know, we were young, you know, young guys getting stoned together or whatever. And they'd start like one guy would start making fun of the other one and be like, ah, you're just a blah, 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 blah. Right. But they, then they'd be high and you'd see him sort of go. Uh. And then they'd sort of lose the thread of the personality that they were in. And they just sort of bob there for a second, spinning their wheels like the transmission wasn't getting um, traction. And then they'd sort of come back in. Very often they'd come back in. If you poked at them a certain way, you'd see their sort of reaction personality come back. Mm. Um, and, and so I guess what I'm getting at, again, in a roundabout way, is that the, the wearing of all these masks and the half conscious transitioning between them in their variety seems similar to me to some multiple personality disorder schizophrenic who has undergone some shock that has shattered their worldview. And I think it's perhaps on a cultural level. You know, God is dead. Nietzsche told us, right? We've shattered all these ideas of right and wrong. We can go free now. And I too can have breasts, right? Um, you have this cultural and individual shattering of all that came before. And as a consequence, there is no ego to knit together these expressions and make sense of them as something whole that has, that is a, a true person rather than a group of arbitrary personalities and somehow microcosm and macrocosm inside and outside to return to that theme of yours. Um, both as a culture, we no longer know what our social roles are and what sort of face we're supposed to be presenting in different circumstances and to the world, but also individually as well. And it's just one sort of absurdity after another now that we're, we're seeing with, I mean, I just watched this one clip of some guy wearing a um, Sith happen Star Wars shirt. I don't know if you saw it, but um he runs some look, looks like a little hobby shop and there's this um there's this birthing person there and that birthing person is like saying oh my god how could you say that i'm not a woman right and he's like you're crazy no one just tells you what's going on of course i don't hold that to be true i would never want to get taken down off of youtube i'm just reporting what that guy said right of course and it's that kind of insanity that kind of absurdity i mean you're you're looking at this dude with this I'm sorry, this birthing person, non-birthing person, maybe? I don't know what to call him anymore, but with a giant fucking bobbing Adam's apple and these huge forearm muscles down there. I'm like, that looks very feminine, the uh, forearm muscles there and the big elbows jutting out and the bobbing Adam's apple. It's almost like you could see a little pecker hanging down there out of the bottom <laughs> of his dress, you know? This, anyway, I'm going too far afield now. I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm high on my own supply here. Go on. What do you have to, <laughs> what do you have to say about this cat? Yeah, look, I... 
I don't think it's any coincidence that as we devolve further and further into clown world, that mental illness becomes more and more prevalent and people are less resilient, less able to handle trauma. Like everybody has PTSD now from something or other. Everybody has depression. Everybody has bipolar disorder. And interestingly, um, as that ramps up, so too does the easy availability of marijuana. I thought it was really interesting when, um, you know, all the lockdowns hit last year, Canada suddenly had an explosion of pot shops popping up and you could just, you know, one of the reasons to leave home was to go and um, drive to your local pot shop and get some green. And liquor stores stayed know, open too. Yeah. As bread, well. Bread, yeah. Bread so, and there's, surfaces. so there's this easy availability of drugs and prescription and otherwise. Um, and, you know, it's it's the Western countries that are falling the fastest into clown world and also the ones that have the highest rates of mental illness and the ease, the easiest access to drugs or at least the least penalties for drugs. You know, you're not going to get a death penalty for having an ounce of marijuana or something on you like you will in some countries. But um, and it's really interesting because people who are mentally ill are probably not the kind of people who should be using drugs like that. Yeah, specifically from what I've seen in my own life is that uh, there there are people who can be high functioning and smoke pot, but um, they are in the minority. And Well, it's um, kind of like what you were saying, like, it, it, do they not have enough going on up there in order to remain connected to themselves even while they're still high? And the answer for most people is no, they don't. They don't. And yeah. when it comes to, uh, you know, other types of substances... You know, I think the kind of people who are most likely to have, say, a bad trip are the people who don't have a strong grounding in their sense of their own being. And, and you it's to... those people whose ego gets shattered. It's like what you were saying, like sometimes it can be something like a bad trip that shatters your ego or it can be some kind of a trauma, anything that just shakes up your perception of reality and how you fit into it. And there are people who have experiences like that and they're just never the same afterwards. Absolutely. And I've seen them. I know a few. There, there's a reason that there is the term acid casualty because mm -hmm. they're, they're a casualty and you're, they're, 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 they're doing the Sid Barrett riff when, when, when they're done um, or when all of it is done with them and they don't properly come back right. You know, they get a weird kind of yeah. mumbling thing. Where even if, even if they don't talk. like have a, have kind of a falling apart of the ego, like oftentimes it just changes their perception of the world such that they have some kind of existential crisis that they aren't equipped to deal with. And part of the reason for that, I think, is because people are so lacking in any spiritual grounding. They don't have any kind of doctrinal foundation through which to interpret and understand those experiences. And so it leads them to a crisis of despair and nihilism of sorts. And then they decide that they're mentally ill and need antidepressants when in fact it's really just um, a lack of spirituality, not necessarily a mental illness. Or any point of orientation. My old friend Tim talked to me when I was a young man and we were talking about psychedelics and stuff. And he's like, that's all fine and good, but it seizes you. It suddenly puts you on the top of the mountain. You have no idea where you, how, how to get, how you got there because you did not do so under your own steam. And you can't come back from that unless you wait your six hours for shrooms or 12 hours of sleeplessness or whatever for, for acid, you know, it's, it's not under your control. Now I don't yeah. want to seem like we're just willfully going off into the subject of drugs, but it does apply here because part of this Saturnalia yes. aspect, sort of part of this carnival aspect is the intoxication. And what mm -hmm. we're specifically seeing is types of intoxication. Well, I mean, just look at it. It's like you're, you're supposed to be intoxicated all the time, you know? Yes. It's not, it's not something that is set aside for a certain thing. Yeah, or, like it's you know, normal now to just drink alcohol every day. Or the, think about the cursing. I'm the worst one for it. So, you know, I'm Are not you? judging anyone. But, <laughs> but cursing and saying, you know, using uh, curse words all the time. It's, I mean, when I grew up, you didn't do that. And you didn't no, you see didn't. it on- And now you hear children doing it. Oh yeah, and it's it's all over the joint. I mean, social media is absolutely full of it. Again, I'm a bad offender, but I'm 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 a grown ass man right now. So if I want to cuss and all that sort of stuff, I, you know, I suppose I can because I'm not in theory uh, interacting with people under eighteen, right? But it does. Right. It, it degrades everything. The, the the constant intoxication, the sexualization of everything, 
the 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 flattening, the lack of hierarchy that you talked about at the outset, that's discussed in uh, Guénon as well. Um, on all sides, we see this this overflowing of the boundaries, and the question is, you know, what do we get left with? I kind of want to come back around, if I may, because we've got about a half hour left. Um, to this idea, this is going to summon its own Lent. It must, of a course, at some point, call yeah. forth its own reaction. And I guess it's a question of to what extent. I guess it's a question of when. But um, it, it has to be coming. I think that, and I love this expression, the desert of Lent. People are going to have an opportunity to be penitential to give all of this some thought and perhaps to uh, shuffle about with uh, the mark of the cross in ashes upon their head. Um, if not literally, then certainly metaphorically. And it, it kind of brings me to the next thing, which is these things are not separate. It's like the coward and the bully that we talked about at the mm -hmm. beginning of the discussion. I think that Lent is going on at the same time as carnival. Because, uh, so to speak, you understand me, metaphorically, look at the way in which so many people now are deeply penitential, meaning, you know, giving it thought. I certainly am. I have, I'm, I'm praying for deliverance and salvation. You know, probably most of us are not doing much in the way of um, almsgiving and care for others and the poor. But definitely in the sense of uh, fasting, we've been pre prevented, we we no longer have access to the things that are pleasurable, not the, the foul and constant indulgences, right? Not the superficial crap, but it, we're fasting, so to speak, from in the absence of proper human interactions. We're deprived mm -hmm. of them. And we've got this mediated swill instead. And so we're, we're, we're praying for redemption, trying to get the hell out of these circumstances that have been foisted upon us. We're, we're certainly uh, penitential about it in the sense of giving it thought. We're deprived, and so we're fasting. You know, As I said, maybe the almsgiving that's part of Lent is uh, not so much represented there. But you know, these things are going on at the same time. Perhaps there will, will, will come a point when the reaction... Um, yeah, somebody just made a, a good point that the, the, the aspect of fasting is about self-restraint and that it, can't, it doesn't properly map because in the one case, it's supposed to be something you undertake yourself. That's a fair point. But my general theme here, the metaphor wasn't working out well, is the idea that these things are somehow happening simultaneously. They're, the one is always the seed of the other. That's why the damn yin yang looks like it does, right? The black section has white as its heart. The, the white section has black as its heart. I mean, we even see it with the tradition of the virtues and vices, you know, where where uh, pride over superbia, overweening pride is uh, lies as a, a, a vice core of the vor virtue of fortitude. Right. Anything that can be considered a vice has as its seed a virtue. Every virtue has as its seed a vice. Somehow the Lent, somehow the period of reflection, somehow the period of stepping back from this and the reimposing of order must be inherent within this thing. That's my air. Yeah. I'm going to stop talking now. It's your turn, Kat. <laughs> yeah. Um, what you were kind of saying uh, a few minutes back regarding like there is no point of orientation anymore for people. I mean, that's that's a necessary part of living in chaos. There isn't supposed to be any centralized point because that would establish a hierarchy. So it's that is something that cannot be included in a disordered world. But from a traditionalist perspective, there is this concept of centrality. Um, and it is like the king, the sacred king was supposed to embody the centrality. There's this idea that there is this unmoved mover at the center of everything who spins the wheel but is not himself affected by it the center point itself never spins take away that center and now suddenly that wheel is off its axis and it starts spinning out of control until it just eventually falls over and crashes um so that's kind of what we're seeing here and instead of having it's interesting because 
there's this push towards like this global hegemony that's almost like, you know, it wants to be that central point of order, except it's not actually providing any pathway to the transcendent and lifting everyone else up. It achieves it by pushing everyone else down um, into the same um, equal level of misery while itself rises to the top. And this is actually very anti-traditional because it's not a proper hierarchy. And, um, you know, I think a lot of people, a lot of modern people kind of feel that the idea of hierarchy is a bit offensive to them because they think of it as this singular point of dominance over everything uh, everyone that's weaker and less fortunate, which is what like this global hegemony would achieve in its own version of hierarchy. But um, traditionally, hierarchies were two way relationships. Um, so it's kind of like, you know, if you think of um, our relationship with pets, for example, like we think that we're above our pets because we're humans and we're their owners. But if you were an alien looking in on the human pet relationship, you might think the pet is at the top of that hierarchy because here we are, fools that we are, going out to earn money to buy food and toys and vet bills and stuff for these pets. And we take care of them and they get to just sleep all day and live the good life. And we pet them and tell them we love them and that they're good boys. And you know, we don't get anything really material in return from them, right? No, so, other than skyrocketing taxes to cover their welfare costs. Yeah. Yeah. So they're really living quite a privileged life. And it's like we're their servants rather than the other way around. Right. Um, but the human is still ultimately in charge. And and so there's that give and take going on. And there's a sense of responsibility and love and stewardship that we have towards our pets, even though they're totally dependent on us and they can't really offer us much, um, the hierarchy still exists, but it's that two-way relationship. And this is something people often misunderstand when they're thinking about hierarchy in the ancient world, especially in regards to things like the caste system or um, you know, the, the aristocracy versus the plebeians. And it wasn't just like, let's exploit everybody below us for our own gain. It was like, no, because we have this elevated position, we have a sacred duty to um, look after the well-being of those who are below us and do everything we can to elevate them. And so that doesn't exist in clown world anymore. Instead, all the hierarchies are based on this kind of like, to use the language of the left, systems of oppression. Like they're not actually wrong when they say stuff like that. Their interpretation of it is often wrong. But in clown world, that is the only hierarchy you will see are these systems of oppression and dominance rather than these two way reciprocal relationships. So, you know, yeah, we do have like this wealthy elite that exploits the rest of the world and, and they don't care who they hurt. They don't care what happens to us. They'd probably be happy if we all just died off. Um, and that is not that is so anti-traditional. If, if they were a uh, traditionalist elites, um, they would actually be genuinely working toward the betterment of everyone below them and being good stewards of the earth and the people on it. Yeah, it's that whole idea that uh, plenty of people hammer on, you know, that with the, the, with the freedom comes the obligation, you know, and that they have to go hand in hand or they're, they're without the other, without the one, the other is meaningless and vice versa, you know. Well, and there's just a complete misunderstanding these days of even what freedom is, because what people think of freedom nowadays is really just their enslavement. It's just bonds chaining them to their material existence. They become attached to objects and outcomes and relationships and all of this stuff just binds them deeper into materiality. There's no liberation that comes with that. I mean, real liberation would be able to, you know, be existing in the world, but not being affected by it, being an unmoved mover unto yourself, so to speak, um, to be equanimous with what comes and to just, you know, roll with the punches and accept like, you know, this is the, this is my karmic hand that I've been dealt in life and I'm going to just do the best I can with it. I mean, you know, that maybe brings up some, you know, questions regarding fate and free will that could be a whole nother conversation in itself. But, um, you know, real freedom is being able to decide how you react to something 
whether or not you're pulled along by circumstances or whether or not you steer the ship through the waters of those circumstances. Yeah, my friend Tim likes to distinguish that as the difference between freedom and, and liberty. You know, he would talk about his time in prison and he's like, you know, I was not at liberty to do X, Y, and Z. However, I remain perfectly free, perfectly and completely free. I mean, it's essentially, it's not just a Tim thing. It's essentially a stoic view, right? Yeah, sure. your, your response to that circumstance is, is what matters. And these people don't, I mean, these people, you know, whatever. Um, a, a one thing that did come to my mind when you were talking about this idea of the four quarters um, and the idea of there being this sort of centralizing, you know, you can see it as the axis mundi. Um, it's certainly, um, what is it? Uh, I think it's Mercea Eliade's book, The Sacred and the Profane, talks about the world axis, the axis mundi. You see it uh, manifest in different ways. You know, it could be Legba uh, climbing the pole of the Hunfo as the messenger in the realm of Voudon. You know, it could be Mercury or Idris, you know, flying around with the Caduceus, you know. Um, but there is the idea of the axis and the communication. Well, it, there's also this idea of the center point. You know, you can call it the navel of the world. You can call it Mount Meru, right, with its uh, four quarters and directions. But there is the idea of the mountain and the division into the four directions. And, you know, it's very interesting coming back around to this idea of the personae and the idea of a shattering experience that breaks down the personality. There is a, a guy who is more or less of the Jungian school, although he might have had some aspects of the Hillman depth psychology thing going on as well. I can't remember. It's been so damn long since I read it, but um, his name is John Weir Perry. I think he eventually got into all kinds of trouble for banging one of his patients, which simply isn't done, old man. Um, but he was uh, well known. He wrote some good books and should not be judged for, um, at least his books should not be judged for his behavior. And he's got um, two of them. Um, one of them is called uh, The Far Side of Madness, and the other one is called The Lord of the Four Quarters, which rather fits with the observation you were making, Kat. Um, and he noticed in working with people who are schizophrenic that there was a particular path they took if they were allowed to. And his very important thing was he did not approach it like most of the psychiatrists these days who attempt to just shove any delusional material off the table, right? He did not approach it where give them a pill if they say they're seeing weird shit, right? Instead, he said, wait a minute, let's treat the delusional material as though it's part of the process of getting well and read it, so to speak. Let's find out what it is, right? And he found, at least according to his um, uh, dealing with material, that um, certain of these patients that he dealt with within a clinical setting, when they were allowed, first off, they were nobody acted to repress their quote unquote delusional material that they would begin to exhibit certain types of ideation. Um, particularly with females, they would talk about how they were giving birth to a new child and they would have like weird ideas of giving birth to a Christ child or the idea that something new would be born within them and it would like redeem everything and sort everything out. But they would also get into drawing mandalas that very often dealt with four quarters and a center point. And so, the idea is that when the personality is shattered in this way, there is a return to order that wants to be born out of that disorder. And you can even see it in the old alchemical books. If you look at some of the copper plate engraving, some of the stuff produced by like a Theodore de Bry or, you know, all that Rosicrucian period stuff from the 17th century, you'll see very often what's shown as a massa confusa. And they'll actually create it in a diagram that looks rather like the um, the um, uh, uh, which you have on the wall there behind you, the batik or whatever it is, in the sense of like a circle. But it'll be shown as a confused mass of like the light and dark all intermixed, right? And then they show it in a sequence of images where the next one will move to where the light and dark are separated, or the earth has been separated from the waters, or the waters above and the waters below. And the idea is that alchemical massa confusa confused mass um, has an order that eventually comes to it if consciousness is brought to it and it will divide properly into the different directions and the elements will be separated and it will return to order again. Um, and I think that that is something that is perhaps coming uh, for all of us in the, in, in terms of this Lent that I can see this, this, 
whatever it is that is the that corresponds to this chaos and this carnival and this degradation that we're so lucky to enjoy at present. Um, hopefully it will be like uh, on a macro level, on a cultural level, like us coming out of a kind of schizophrenia and order will be restored. But we'll, we'll have to see how that goes. It seems you might have something to uh, share with us, though. What is this I see? Um, do, do I see oh, a book no. here? I, yeah, you do see my book. Um, <laughs> what you were saying regarding like kind of those four quarters and how it relates to that concept of the center point, that's actually, um, Gwinnon actually talks about that within this same book in an earlier chapter. So anybody who's like interested in these topics, if you wanted to get this book, as I said, it's called Symbols of Sacred Science, chapter eight, the center, uh, the idea of the center in traditions of antiquity. And it goes into all of the ways that like these four quarters are divided up, how they relate to this concept of a circumference and the center point. And um, I was just kind of looking to see if there was just like a, a good little summing up quote within it that I maybe had already underlined, but it's kind of a bit of a long chapter and I couldn't really find exactly what I was looking for because I hadn't like marked it out ahead of time because I didn't know you were going to bring out the point, but um, that is something that is discussed um, in detail in this book, which if you get the book, it actually doesn't look gray. I'd just taken the cover off. It's actually like white and it's got like a red symbol on the front. So if you go looking for it online, you're not looking for a gray book. You're looking for one with a white cover with a red design. Well, um, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, it would be nice to have the perfect little closing quote, but you know, it is I not would. always That's the case. That's what I was hoping to look for. and. Um, but yeah, there's actually some really interesting uh, relationships between that concept and the swastika and the polar myth um, and all of that stuff, which I just like personally, I just like love the symbolism and stuff. And I'm just like, it's it's kind of just almost another analytical tool for my mind to turn on. But it's um, like, that's just kind of my bread and butter. That's what I spend most of my time reading about is stuff like that. So um, yeah, if people like that then they should check out my series on revolt against the modern world because i try to incorporate as much of that into it as i can indeed well everyone should be checking out your channel and your work on uh yeah they on should Ebola as well <laughs> absolutely and if they don't i mean what the hell is wrong with them right i mean absolutely yeah everyone's cool, cool. gwenon's cool absolutely well, is cool uh well we're the, new we're the new counterculture uh, gotta, th th there you go. Gotta, um, gotta light the path out of the darkness of clown world. But I, I did look because I haven't looked closely at Gwinnon, and and we've talked about this before offline. You know the the Evola. I'm just beginning to look at. Um, I have a little better opinion of Evola than I do of Gwinnon, though, because I mean he just went off to Egypt and became a fake Sufi. You know, so it's kind of um, like man. I do prefer meh. I do prefer Evola to Gwinnon. Gwinnon is um, I really like his uh, work on symbolism and stuff. He's really a master of that, and um, his book that we've been reading from is probably one of my favorite books on the subject. Um, I especially like it because it, like with my studies in astrology and stuff, it ties in a lot with that and just gives me a deeper understanding. So, like symbolism isn't something that Evola talks a lot about. He does like in books, like say like the hermetic tradition and stuff like that. There's some of that in there, but um, you know, he kind of went off in a different direction uh, to Gwinnon, but I, I like both. It's just like, you know, if I had to pick one, it's always going to be Evola probably. Yeah. I think Obviously. Cause otherwise why would I be spending all my time making this series on Evola right. if he wasn't my number one choice? <laughs> right. He's definitely the, um, the, the, the white male cat of your, literature selections right the one that you 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 shower with your attention and indulgence like your your living white cat that you do possess yes um i saw from what little i have read of evola i've read a bit um he seems to assume that you're going to have some knowledge of the symbolism and doesn't like get sidetracked explaining it to yes. you as he talks um, exactly and that's where he becomes kind of hard to read because if you just don't have a background in what he's talking about like you've got really no frame of reference for it so that's why I try to bring some of that into my explanations and kind of try to flesh it out a bit for people because like one of the reasons it takes me so long between episodes, it's not just because like I have other stuff going on in my life as we all do, but I do a lot of background reading to make sure like if he's got something footnoted and he's referencing a book, I'm going to go and try to find that book and I'll probably end up reading the whole thing. Even if it doesn't make it into the episode, it's just like I need to understand where he's coming from. 
so that I'm not misinterpreting them and I'm not teaching people the wrong things. Because if I make an assumption about what he's saying and I haven't fact checked that, fact checked, <laughs> real fact checking, not clown world fact checking. Right. Um, but if I haven't done that due diligence, then I'm liable to just put my foot in my mouth and say the wrong thing. And then my comments are going to be full of like, oh, you misinterpreted Evola. Yeah. Because what else could a woman do but misinterpret Evola? Right. Yeah. I don't even <laughs> want to go there, man. Yeah. I didn't even think about that dimension of, you know. Look, you know of... what? It's the fact that a woman's talking about Evola just shows that we're in clown world. Well, there it is, I'm, right? You, I, am, you I am contributing to the carnival here. Right. You shouldn't have to do this job, right? If I everything know. were turned right side up, you could occupy yourself with other things. But unfortunately... If everything you know. were turned right side up, my karma would have had me been born a man, I assure you. Yes, well... But alas, here we are. I feel like I was like on the fence and the gods were like, yeah, she hasn't quite earned that. Tipped me to the, the feminine side for this lifetime. I'll try again in my next lifetime. There you go. Based. Based answer. You're like, I'm sorry, world, that I'm a female. Next time around, I'll be male. You know what? A like woman that. who is perfectly woman is superior to a man who is imperfectly man. Evola himself says that. So my karma in this life is just to be the best woman I can be and hope for better in the next life. There it is. Well, I just noticed someone here saying uh, white cat gang. I have to say that um, white male cats vastly inferior to what I've had, which is black female cats. Black female They're cats. They're the most neurotic. They're so crazy. What are you talking about? What nonsense? What insane nonsense are you spouting now? That black cats are the ones who are crazy? Or are you saying or maybe black I misunderstood? Black cats have you. neurosis. What are you talking about? They do, about? especially the females, and especially if they haven't had a litter of kittens. I've worked with a lot of cats of all different colors, and the black ones are a little bit. Yeah. White cats always have a great personality. Because they can't Except hear you. mine, who's being like really... No, they're not all deaf. My cat's not deaf. That's what you think. <laughs> well, Sorry. I know he's not, because if I sing the right song for him for his bedtime, he does come running and put himself to bed, so... Okay, you just explained... I've tested it. You just illustrated the fact that your cat's neurotic. If it comes running when you sing it a song for bedtime, that's a neurotic cat. It should he's sneer... Spoiled. It should that's sneer at that. <laughs> Any well-adjusted cat will sneer at your songs and come and go as it pleases. That's all I know. That's all I know. Well, he's sneering at our conversation because he hasn't come in to say hello at all, which is unusual. But in, normally if I'm like speaking to somebody else, he's like, hey, why aren't you paying attention to me? He probably decided to do you a solid and not like rub white fur all over your black top. You know, oh my he's God. all like, let's just go ahead and give her a break this time. Right. <laughs> Yes, I said in the chat that that's why we were late to start because I couldn't find a lint roller and I had white cat fur all over my black top. <laughs> well, at least, you know, th this is so, a good thing. I don't want people thinking that it was like your boomer failures as to why we weren't on time because in this case, it was actually my fault. You I'll, you were there early. Normally, it is my boomer failure, so it might as well be. So, you know, no problem. If you had showed up on time, I would have been late. I mean, that's just inevitably how it goes. Um we have um, we have just a couple of minutes left. Um, I would say take a question, but it, the time is short, and I do want to have um, a, a give you another opportunity to um, share with everybody your um, your links and stuff. So maybe let's do this. Let me, if if it's okay with you, before I turn it over to you to share the links and your projects again, and talk about Uberfolk again, please. Um, don't forget that. Um, but before I do that, if Anybody here has good ideas for Kat and I to do an episode in future? Um, mm. Please, please share it down in the not in the chat because I'll just lose track of that and I won't go back and review it. But put it in the comments um, under the video once it posts. Um, you know, yeah, fully after the. Yeah, and I'm. You know, we're always. It's not a joke. We've talked probably over the last year. Like, hey, what should we talk about? And we're like, eh, and then we go off our separate ways. So if you have good ideas, share them with us. And uh, we'll follow up on that. And um, I guess last, but certainly not least, um, tell, see Charlemagne's coming in here talking this nonsense. You see the kind of crap I have to put up with. You should do a stream <laughs> on the metaphysics of Sonic the Hedgehog. These people, I never man, watched it. No, I don't watch it. It's a game. It's all horrifying. Pay no oh. mind. <laughs> Pay no mind to him. Um, so, uh, let's leave that be before a whole tide of all kinds of um, snarky crap appears in the comments. Um, 
come back around. Tell us uh, everybody where they can follow you. I definitely recommend your channel highly. Um, don't forget all the different places like the telegrams and the rest and, and tell everybody again about Uberfolk because you should be promoting your music as well, which you spend a lot of time on. Ah, uh, yes. Well, um, so if you just type in like Philosophicat as it appears on the screen into most any social media platform, I should be the one that comes up. Um, should be fairly recognizable either with like a thumbnail of me or my little white cat, depending. Um, and so, yeah, Twitter, Telegram. I'll be back on Twitter after this weekend. I think that's when my ban ends. Um, I really don't use the other platforms like Facebook and Gab and Minds all that much. I just like they're just not easy platforms for me to use. Um, obviously, I've got, you know, my YouTube channel. I do have it backed up on BitChute and Odyssey. Um, and I mean, I've, like, if you want you, to support You are the on channel, Odyssey also? I am, yes. It's supposed to do like an automatic backup to Odyssey. So I don't know what will happen if I ever actually lose my YouTube channel. But um, I'm not technologically savvy enough to have figured that out. And I'm just going to kind of leave it with someone else to figure out. Um, but yeah, so there's that. And if you want to support the channel, there's like Patreon and Subscribestar and stuff like that. But I'm happy just for people to, to watch and like and share and um, just get some value out of it for themselves if they can. Um, it's something I would make regardless, just because I really personally enjoy doing it. And uh, yes, Uber folks. So um, we do have a few things in the works, um, a potential, you know, collaboration in the works. Our previous um the people who are doing like the instrumentals for our last album like they're not really able to do that anymore because of changes in their lives and stuff but we've got someone else that uh we're working with and i think george might have two tracks ready to release on spotify soon um with him on vocals i haven't really been able to do that much um myself and after this stream i'm going to be packing up all my recording equipment and won't have access to it for a little while but um yeah, so there's there's that. The music is definitely still going to be going ahead. Um, and hopefully, you know, maybe we'll have another album in the works. I don't know if we'll actually release it like as an album, but we might just kind of release songs as they become available because that seems to be what people do in the modern days. Like nobody really, unfortunately, buys CDs anymore. You know, it used to be such an event to go to the music store, pick out a CD, come home, listen to it with all your attention on it while you look through the lyric booklet. And that's just unfortunately not a thing anymore so um yeah, yeah. that's a thing we'll probably the past sadly i have many fond memories of doing that and um yeah so we'll you know we'll release the songs as they become available and people can definitely keep an eye on that right on and did you I, i'm so spaced out did did you mention where they can find the music itself um yeah so we're on all the major streaming platforms and we do have a youtube channel um Uber folk with like the German U with the umlaut. Umlaut. And, yeah, yeah. Yes. yes. Um, but folk in English, not like the German folk with the V. Um, oh. And you can find that either on YouTube. And if you can't find it, it's linked through my channel on basically every video because we use our Uber folk songs on there. So. Right. So at a minimum, they can find it through Philosophica. Yes. Okay. Yes. But if you look it up on like Spotify or iTunes or whatever it is you use, it should be there. Um, the only thing that's not there is our revolt against the modern world songs. Those are only on YouTube. Yeah. So let's see. All right. Um, Charlemagne is very kindly posting links. So people should be able to find oh, that. Thank Excellent. you, Charlemagne. Yes, he's, he's in my Telegram chat, I think. And he's, he always has good contributions. So he's, he's a good guy. Got to give him a shout out. Absolutely. He's mighty, unless you piss him off, in which case he'll chisel at you hard. Um, okay. So um, I think that covers it, unless there's anything else you want to add? Um, no, I think that's good. If we start adding other things, we might end up here for another two hours. <laughs> so, yes, indeed. Well, I thank you very just... much. Right. Snip it. Is it Atropos, I think, who cuts the thread? Yes. will be Whatever that fate is that cuts the thread, it shall be cut now. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Kat, for being here. Um, uh, I'll be back next time and soon. But until then, um, uh, th th that's where it stands. So I am Semiagog, and uh, I am 